what, what do you get somebody who has everything? Well, here's a really challenging one. What do you get of somebody who owns the universe, who created it with his hands, shaped it not just with his thoughts, but with his words, spoke it into existence, who holds the stars in space, moves the sun across the sky, that, and, and gives us the color that we enjoy, the flavors that we love, what do you give to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Son of God, the Most Holy One? What do you give Him on Christmas Day? Well, that's probably why we don't give Him much, right? We, we give all kinds of presents to everybody else. I mean, isn't it really odd? How many of you go to a birthday party and you give presents to each other rather than the person you're celebrating their birthday? I mean, isn't it just a little bit odd that we get, spend so much to give gifts and spend all kinds of money on each other when Christmas is a celebration of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God coming in human form, limiting himself within that, mother, that young lady's womb and then inside that human body and staying here until he would sacrifice himself, give the ultimate gift, pay the ultimate price, die on a cross, be brutally beaten and suffer. And the suffering, folks, as bad as it was physically, the suffering he experienced when all of our sin comes on him, this pure, clean, undefiled God himself who suddenly becomes, what an amazing text, becomes sin for all of us. And then the final pain, the father part of him turns his back on him and rejects him. Oh my, what do you give somebody like that? I think we'll see in our text this morning, it's a, it's a favored text, it's a very familiar one. And, and remember, the familiar texts are the ones that are dangerous for us. They're dangerous for us because as soon as I start to read this text, you say, oh, I know it. And you're going to say it in your own version. And then you're going to fall asleep. Right? Because it's so familiar. And so, you know, what more, you know, I mean, pastors struggle with this at Christmas time. What do you say about this text that you've, you've read now every year and multiple times and at Christmas Eve celebrations and Christmas celebrations, you know? So how do you bring meaning out of this? Folks, today it's not my job to be meaning, bring meaning out of it. It's yours. It's your job to live this text. <coughs> the Magi, the wise men. Three kings, well, there's nothing in the Bible that says that. <laughs> I have a quiz I was going to share with you and decided not to uh, waste the time today because I was getting distracted by it. <laughs> but yes, it, it's got about 30 questions on it, ask you all kinds of things about, about Christmas. Um, how did Mary and Joseph get to Bethlehem? How many of you say they walked? Raise your hand. How many of you say they rode a donkey? Raise your hand. How many of you say that they got there by airplane? Raise your hand. <laughs> we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But, but we'll, we'll do some things with this little story on Christmas Eve. And, and we kind of talk about a donkey, don't we? And all the animals. Do you, by the way, do you know how many animals were there in the manger? In, in that cave or that barn or whatever it was. Do you know how many were there? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. There may have been none. <laughs> There's all kinds of things that we put in as extra stuff, but that's all it is. It's extra stuff. But the fact is, is that these men come a long distance. How many? Probably a whole host of them. Probably 10, 20, or even more. We don't know. Had to be a large caravan. I'm quite certain of that. They're interesting men because they come from where? From the Medes and the Persians. Incidentally, do you remember the Medes and the Persians? Do you remember a very famous man in the Bible who was a leader there? Daniel, Daniel thank you. Belteshazzar. Daniel. The same Daniel of Daniel and the lion's den. The Daniel who is able to give wisdom and counsel. And he becomes the leader of the who? Guess what? The Magi. 
He becomes when the leaders of the men of wisdom, the men who are giving counsel to the leader of the Medes and the Persians, to the king. And, and so from those roots, and those roots have gone on, so much so that a star comes up, rises in the east, they see that star, and they recognize, because they're great men of wisdom, they've listened to the scriptures, they've listened to the, to the times, they've watched the, sco- the stars. And there's an interesting thing. At this time in human history, there was kind of this sense around the world that a king, a very special king, was going to come from where? <laughs> from Israel. Why did they think that? Who knows? Except that God had planted the thought within the world and the nations will know that his son is coming. Well, let's look at the text. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, Did you already hear a word that we don't necessarily think of? When did the Magi, when does this text say it happened? After Jesus was born. Well, watch out for this one. Did the wise men visit Jesus at the manger? Probably not. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, During the time of King Herod, and incidentally, the Bible is really good about giving us information, isn't it? Details, times, and dates in ways that you cannot ignore, you can't deny. Was there a King Herod? (laughs) Count on it. He was a pretty nasty guy. He was so bad that he actually killed his own son the night before he's about to die. Why? Because he wants the people. And he actually goes out and says to his soldier, I want you to go out and kill a thousand men in the city. Why? Because when I die, I want people to be grieving Yeah, because he knew they wouldn't grieve him. So he wants to be weeping and wailing. He kills his own family members to make sure that he can hold on to the crown. Okay, this is a guy that's pretty greedy with the crown. He's going to Rome, and he spent time in Rome. He played the whole Senate up until they sent him back there as the ruler of Israel, the king of the Jews. Herod's not a well-liked guy. And we have lots of detailed information about him. So King Herod, Magi, this is wise men. They're not probably kings at all, in fact, although we sing we three kings of Orient are, bearing gifts we traverse afar. The the fact is, is that these are men who watch the times. They are counselors for the leaders. They do watch the stars. They're not astrologers. They're astronomers. They're watching the heavens for things and un- unusual things. And they give, and in that watching, they see something incredible. So what does it say? Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? They incidentally know it's past tense as well. We saw his star in the east have come to worship him. Somewhere in the east, we saw a star. Did did the people in Jerusalem see the star? We don't know. What was the star? All kinds of thoughts about that. There's a great video out, and then some people have debunked that video, saying that's not really accurate. But nevertheless, the fact is, is that something showed in the heavens. Was it Jupiter and Saturn coming together, and therefore this bright arch? Maybe. Was it some kind of uh, a gal? Excuse me. Um, an asteroid or something else coming through? Well, we don't know what it was. Was it a real star? Well, let me ask you this. God is being born in human flesh. It's a miracle. Isn't that true? Do you think he could do the miracle of putting a star up there? And according to this one video, it will tell you that the star was actually there from the beginning of time. And it actually records it. And like I say, some people debunk the video. But it's an incredible uh, analysis of the heavens. The heavens have been the same and and going through their dynamic life cycle since the beginning of time, since God created them. And in those heavens, God did something to shine. Some say, well, what they saw was the angels. They saw the angels. They were over in the east, a few few hundred miles away, but they saw the light of the angels when they appeared to the shepherds. Because what does it say? That there was glory in the heavens. And the angels shone about them. And they were afraid because of this bright light. 
And so who knows? Maybe they were watching that. We don't know exactly what they saw, but we know that they saw something, something so significant, something so incredible that it drew them to come and say, we got to find out what it is. And their belief was a king's just been born. Where? In Jerusalem. We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. And this is in a very important phrase. When King Herod finds this out, you could kind of expect him to be disturbed, wouldn't you? This is a guy who kills family members who are the rightful heirs to the throne and he doesn't want anyone taking that throne away because family members tend to do that. You know, young guy says, you know, dad, you're old. <laughs> Goodbye, okay, uh, or, or a nephew or somebody else jealous in the family, and so we're going to get rid of him, and we're going to take the throne. But why did Herod think that would happen? Because he had done it, and now he's killed family members, so, and so Herod's disturbed, rightly so. He does not want there to be another king of the Jews. He doesn't want to compete with anybody else. He's an egotist, an egomaniac, and he's in control, and he knows he's in control, except that now he hears a king's been born, and this is troubling to him. But did you see the rest of the phrase? When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Why are they upset? See, here's another reason why it was probably more than just one, two, three, probably a host of these guys who have come to town in a large caravan, and they're all spreading around town. They're saying, we need to find out where the king is, and they're asking people. If somebody came into town here, a group of 20 or 30 people driving their vans, their motorcycles all up, okay, there we go. 20 or 30 motorcycles ride into town, and we can tell they're not from here because they're not wearing their black shirts or, you know, okay. They're, 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 they're obviously from someplace else, and they, they ride into town, all their Harleys, right? Got to be Harleys, right, Mike? Okay. So, so they ride in with the, on these motorcycles, and they come down, and you all hear the roar and all. And then they're riding around through town, and they're asking you, and they, so they go over to Mick's place, and they're, Mick, where's the king that's been born up here in Crestline? And they go up to Virgil, Virgil, where's the, the king that's been born in Crestline? And, the, and they go over to Doug, Doug, where's the king that's been born in Crestline? And so they're going to, all around the town, they're doing this, Jay, where's the king that's been born in Crestline? They're clear up there, bothering your chickens and everything, okay, Nikki? Who knows what's happening? But the, but the word's going all around, and in a town like Crestline, don't you think we'd hear about it? <laughs> and Jerusalem is such, and the word's going out, and, but notice this word, it's an incredible word, and all of Jerusalem was disturbed as well. Some say that the reason they were disturbed is because they knew what Herod would do, and they knew it was going to get bloody. They knew it was going to be bad, and so that's why they're disturbed, really? Why are they disturbed? Because they have so bought into their lifestyle that they don't want to be interrupted by the, riot, by the Messiah. Oh, no. Okay, the Messiah is supposed to come and set us free. That means war is coming. Oh, we don't want to be a part of that. And they're disturbed and they're upset. Their plans, folks, are being interrupted by God. Hmm. Many of us need to put the shoe on and see if it fits. Some of our lives are being interrupted by God's plans because we've got all these things we're busy with. And Christmas is one of those examples in which we have so much we've got to do, so many things we're being a part of that to try to work God into it. Okay, God, we'll, we'll, we'll go Sunday morning. Is that enough? And we get disturbed because God wants to interrupt us because he says, look, it's not about you. It's about the people that I want to save. And I want you to tell them about my love. And they're disturbed. Hmm. They've already been celebrating Hanukkah. It's interesting. Hanukkah only started about 150 years before Christ. Did you know that? It's not in the Torah. It's not written about in the, in, in the word of God. 
but it was something that started later because while they were having a celebration and during a rebellion, the, some um, king had come in and set up his dirty stuff and his gods in the temple and the, the, the Maccabees came in and said, we're not going to allow that and they kicked him out and they consecrated the temple again and they lit the, the lamp there in the temple and it burned for eight days miraculously until they could bring more oil. It's an incredible thing. They only had enough for one day and yet it burns for eight. So now what do they do in Hanukkah? They celebrate the fact of the burning of the oil for eight days. Incidentally, what's interesting about that one is, is that that story didn't become a part of the tradition until some three to 400 years after. <laughs> what they were really celebrating was there had been a revolt because the temple had been defamed and the Maccabeans had come in there and broken in and kicked out the, the dirty gods. And that's what they were celebrating. Later, it gets some extra meaning to it. Uh, incidentally, a little bit like Christmas does, isn't it? So our Santa Claus stories on all of the things that go around Christmas and all that get added. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, yay! <laughs> and ha did, you, did you all buy stuff on Super Saturday? Oh, I'm sorry, you missed out on the best sales of the year. Who are these wise men? Counselors? God seekers? Ones who are seeking to worship God? This is a question I want to ask you this. Um, by the way, we're already a couple places down, Mike. Uh, I, I already did, does Christmas disturb you? <laughs> it disturbed them. Does Christmas disturb you? Is Jesus in the way of all the things you want to do at Christmas? Is he an interruption to all of your activity? Does he disturb you? Second question I'd ask is, have you sought God's counsel this Christmas? Did you take the time as you were doing your shopping? You say, Bill, you should have asked us a few weeks ago. I was. I kept talking about forgotten Christmas. I kept talking about, and Becky joined me, and we were trying to say, look, what are you going to do to make Christmas different so you're not caught up in all the trappings and all the stuff and spending all kinds of money? Because that's not really what's important. Get back to what's important. Get back to Jesus Christ. Have you sought God's counsel this Christmas? Have you sought God's counsel? Should we go to that family gathering? Oh, so-and-so is going to be there. Can't we avoid it again? How do we deal with them? Have you sought God's counsel? Or have you just complained to God about it? Or complained to somebody else? Have you been looking for God in the midst of this Christmas season? It's interesting. Herod seeks godly counsel. Wow, go figure. Herod was actually a pretty interesting guy. Do you know that he also would buy food for people and serve meals and he took care of needy people in his community? In fact, he did so much for the community, that's one of the reasons why they liked him. They liked him and hated him almost at the same time. And they just wanted, were glad that they weren't part of his family and they knew they were safer. <laughs> Herod seeks godly counsel. And when he goes to that counsel, who does he go to? This is very important. He goes to the religious leaders of the day. He goes to scribes and Pharisees, people who know the scriptures. And he says... Okay, if this is the Messiah, if the, if the king of the, of the Jews is coming, where is he supposed to be born? And the guys did what? Uh, we don't know. Uh, Messiah, born? No, I have no idea. I guess he's not coming. No. What do they know? They know the prophecy in Isaiah. Out of Bethlehem of Judah art thou least among the, the tribes, right? Shall come what? Ah, the Messiah. The Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5, 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Do you remember John 7? Does not the scripture say, that the, this is Jesus asking, that the Christ will come from David's family? And from Bethlehem, the town where David lived. Where did they think Jesus was from? Nazareth, of course, right? But where was he born? 
in Bethlehem. So where is the Messiah going to be born? The Messiah is going to be born down there in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a little town about five to six miles south of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, you might know, is kind of like up on a plain, up on a plateau sort of. It's up high. And then there's this kind of like saddle. This kind of like goes down up to another peak over here. And down in the middle of this saddle is where Bethlehem is. Incidentally, in Bethlehem, you can see across to where the Medes and the Persians live. You can see across the lake and the sea, and, and you can actually see, in fact, um, this is said to be an, an incredible place uh, um, where God has met different people. Uh, Rachel, I believe it is, said to be buried there, there's, and they'll, you know, they'll go by right now, you can actually see where Rachel's uh, tomb is, and there's amazing places, things about Bethlehem, but it's just, just this small little town Still kind of insignificant, but it was important for one reason. King David was born there. And David was told that his offspring will sit on the throne forever. And it will be one of his sons birthed in Bethlehem who will be the Savior, the Messiah, have you sought God's counsel this Christmas? Have you, have you tried to get into the word and take some time to listen to God while you've been going through this celebration season? Are you going to do that when you celebrate with, or will, be, will you do the, the yeah, quick, get out the angel food cake, whipped cream on top, single candle in the middle, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear Jesus, happy birthday to you. Now, is that a bad thing to do? I don't think it's a bad thing to do, and for the kids, it's kind of a fun thing to do, but for me, it kind of misses it. It feels shallow. Happy birthday to Jesus. Well, wait a second. I understand that that's when Jesus came and was born in human form. However, when did Jesus be, start? That wasn't his birthday, was it? Hasn't he been there since the beginning of time? Wasn't he there when he created the heavens and the earth and the word spoke? John 1 says, God spoke and the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. It's a living word. It's a real word. God's alive. What? Forever. So he really wasn't born there. So we're kind of missing it even then. I'm sorry if I'm messing up some of you and your Christmas celebration. Sing happy birthday to Jesus. Let the children enjoy it. But do more than that. Don't stop there. Don't stop there. Don't miss God. Okay, so this morning, you've bought, has, has everyone bought all your presents? Has anybody still got shopping to do? Wade and Judy. Are you shopping for each other? Save some time and just, you know. <laughs> what are you giving Jesus this Christmas? He's on your list, isn't he? You planned for him the, the, that special gift because it is his birthday. It is the most important. He is the most important person at the party, isn't he? So what are you giving Jesus this year? Do you remember what the Magi brought with him? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Incidentally, that's why we say there's three kings because there were three gifts. Well, there may have even been more gifts, couldn't there have been? But these three are the three that stand out, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold was a symbol of purity. Frankincense, pure incense, was taken from a tree in South Arabia and Somalia for use in Jewish meal offerings. And when placed on the altar of fire, was a symbol of prayer and thanksgiving to God. In addition, they brought myrrh, which was also taken from the sap of a tree, with, oh, which is this very fragrant wood, and it was used by women to make them more desirable. And was also used by women in their bridal possession, processions. And at times, myrrh was mixed with wine and would be used as an anesthetic. Okay, you're getting ready for surgery. Drink a little myrrh with your wine. It'll help you, you know, conk out. And finally, it was used in preparing a body for burial. The three gifts, it's interesting. Some say that, that those three gifts were significantly used by Jesus and his family. The gold will be used as they travel to Egypt. You're going to see that if you continue to read in Matthew. They're going to head to Egypt for a few years waiting for Herod to die because Herod's going to get so angry that he's going to go try to kill all the children two and under. 
And there will be pain and crying as women, and it's prophesied women, moms will be crying the death of their children because of Herod's evil. They'll need gold to survive in Egypt. The frankincense is used um, for his, in his presentation at the temple. It's part of his offering that they're going to offer up to God, a prayer offering. And the myrrh, well, scholars say that was used to put on his body. It's what the women were bringing to place on him when he was placed in the tomb. They brought three gifts. Gold, it is said, honors his kingship. Frankincense honors his divinity. And myrrh honors his humanity as he was destined to die. What are you going to give Jesus this Christmas? Give him the most important, most valuable thing you have. Give him yourself. Give him your heart. Give him your life. Give him your voice. Give him your time. Give him your worship. Will you worship Jesus? The, the wise men have said they go down to Bethlehem. They leave Herod. Herod said, you know, now, hey, you come back and after you find him, you go do the tough work. You spend the time and the energy. Six-mile walk. I know it's really difficult for a king. So you go down there. You find him. And then when you find him, you come back and you tell me because I want to vow and worship him too. Yeah, right. The wise men don't know that yet. They think, okay, yeah, that's wonderful. We'll go come back and tell you. But they go down. They find Mary and the baby at home. At home. And what does it say they do? When coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You see, even before the gifts, they worshiped him. They worshiped him. So how often will you bow and worship Jesus this Christmas? How will you plan that into the rest of this week? In fact, have you ever really bowed and worshiped Jesus? You see, the danger is, is that because we've become so familiar, we grew up knowing this, many of you were, have been Christians since before you were born, in a sense, that's what you felt like. So you've lived around it and you've gone to all the pageants and all. You've worn the bathrobe dressing up like a shepherd or Mary or somebody else. And you've had angel wings on. You've been shine, shining for Jesus. How, how have you truly worshipped him? You know, Herod wasn't going to bow down, was he? Not at all. You know, what's even sadder is Jerusalem doesn't bow either. It never ceases to boggle my mind to realize that Jerusalem was all disturbed. All these people in the city are all upset because these guys from out of town have come and they've heard the king's been born. And then they hear, the word had to get out there. Surely they knew it. Where's the Messiah going to be born? Bethlehem right down the road. Okay, six miles Job's Peak. Yeah, I know, it's a hard walk out there, right? It's, you know, it's uphill, you know, especially that last mile or so. Yeah, forget that. You know, think about it. You're here, and Jesus is born out on Job's Peak, and you can't walk six miles to go see him? What are we unwilling to do to worship Jesus? Are we willing to go out of our way a little bit? Six little miles. In fact, I'm exaggerating. It was only about five. So you didn't have to wait, walk all the way to the top. Just up to the top of waters, okay? Five miles to see the Messiah that you've supposedly waited your entire life for. What are you willing to do to worship 
Jesus Christ. Herod doesn't worship. Jerusalem doesn't worship. Some foreigners from out of town kneel and worship. True worship is a commitment of your life. And it's a lifestyle change in which Jesus Christ becomes the focus of what you do with your life. It's what it means to be sold out for Jesus Christ. There's a few days left. There's a couple of Christmas Eve services. Is there somebody you know that's never had the privilege of worshiping Jesus? Why don't you give Jesus to somebody this Christmas? Let's pray. God, I'm looking ahead to this week and, oh, well, tasks that I have to do related to my stepdad. Lord, still the preparations. I'm thinking even of the super dinner on, on Wednesday night, the dinner on Thursday. Lord, there's all kinds of tasks and responsibilities. And, Lord, it would be so easy to miss you. And I pray that you'll help me not to do that. Father, call us to worship, to humble ourselves, to literally be broken in spirit, to have that contrite heart, that, that honest conversation with you, that sincere evaluation of our relationship with you and with others. Help us, Lord, to face truth and to bow and worship you. Lord, you deserve much more honor than we probably ever give you. And for that, we ask you to forgive us and cleanse us. You are, you are the most important thing in the world and hopefully in our lives. And yet, Lord, we ask you to forgive us that we allow so much else to take a priority over you. Lord, we want to give you our lives and our worship this Christmas. And I pray that we'll have the energy to walk that short distance to see you. In Jesus' name.